Good morning. Welcome to Real Life. I'm Jim. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, thanks to all of you guys who have been joining me on Thursday nights for our dad's gathering called Um, where we talk about the, kid, the questions that our kids ask us that make us say Um. We had our last gathering this Thursday, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and thanks to all of you who, uh, who helped on our Habitat project. A few of you have asked, a few of you have come up and said, hey, the house we were working on is not done. Can we finish it? Uh, for those of you who are not involved, what happened was there's a, a, a veteran living out in Rancho, and his house caught fire about three years ago, and he's basically been living in a truck beside his house all this time. And Habitat for Humanity, which is this great mission organization, is going in and helping rebuild, not only rebuild his house, but build a better house in its place. And so we've been out there a couple different Saturdays and have been restoring his house and adding a patio, and we're going to uh, keep, keep being involved in that project. So Habitat will always take volunteers if you have the free time, but we're going to organize another day or two for, for us to go down maybe on a Saturday as a church and help work on that house, see it through to the end. So stay tuned for upcoming announcements about when we're going to go down there. And thanks to all of you. I think we had more people the second time than the first time. Thanks to all of you who have come and helped make that project uh, successful so far. Just a heads up, what that's going to lead into is this coming fall, what I'd like to do is take a group of us down to Tijuana, Mexico, where there's a Christian organization that builds about a thousand houses a year down there for people who just don't have places to live. And so if you want to get involved in that, go down there. We're going to go down there and, and build some houses uh, in Mexico this coming fall. We'll train our skills here and then go use them in the next step down there. So uh, stay tuned and look forward to that coming uh, this fall. Uh, I want to take a minute and pray before we open the Bible, before we open God's Word and see what God has to say to us today. I want to take a minute and pray. Especially today, I'd like to pray for uh, people in our midst who are in transition because I know a lot of people have just graduated and they're off to work or school or the next stage of life. Some people are moving away, and so I want to pray for them in that transition. I also know friends in our midst and friends uh, in our community are moving somewhere else this summer. So I want to pray for their transitions because that's a big change. Uh, and just in general, life takes us through changes. There are transitions that come sometimes by surprise, and we need God's hands beneath us as we make those changes. So let's take a minute and lift up our hearts to God. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that your spirit would work in this room for everybody who is in the midst of change and transition, for everyone who is headed into a new stage of life. God, bless the pathway ahead. Prepare a place for them. May we find faith wherever we go, and may we spread faith wherever we go. God, by the power of your Spirit, see us through the ups and downs of this life. May we remember in the midst of change that you are our rock and our strength, that you are the steady one. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your, in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so we're going to get to our study of the Bible this morning. We, we're concluding a series that we've been in for several weeks called Healthy. And we've been looking at different kinds of health that God wants for us. We've talked about being emotionally healthy and relationally healthy and financially healthy and physically healthy. And I want to talk about being spiritually healthy. Uh, and if you've missed any of those, you can go to reallife.la and follow along on the podcast so that you can see the, the whole series because it all kind of hangs together in the end. And, and so uh, you, if you want to go back and catch up on those, we're going to round that out uh, today. And I want to talk about being spiritually healthy. And in particular, I want to talk about a word that Christians like to use. The word is blessed. And sometimes I don't like this word. Sometimes I don't like the word blessed because I hear people use it in a way, and I know what they mean is just lucky. And they feel like, well, I'm religious, so I'm not supposed to say lucky, I'm going to say blessed. Lucky sounds a little bit too much like, like a Las Vegas word, so I'm going to go with blessed. But listen, when a sports team beats another sports team, people praying on both sides, you weren't blessed, you were lucky. Good job. Maybe you're talented, but you weren't blessed. I just, I get a little nervous about Christian's use of the term blessed because Christians sometimes develop a vocabulary that's like a secret handshake that they go around using with other Christians so everybody knows who's on the, on the inside, who's in the club. Uh, I call it evangelese, and we go around using evangelese to talk to other Christians, and sometimes blessed becomes one of those kinds of, of words. I don't know why we landed on that. I like lucky better than blessed anyway. Blessed is like the nerdy younger sister of lucky. 
Lucky goes out dancing at night. Bless goes to the library. That's how that plays out. So I get, and I don't like, I, the, have you ever heard the phrase, blessed to be a blessing? That's a great phrase if you mean it. If you actually mean, God is blessing me so that I can share it with others. That's a great idea. If by blessed to be a blessing, you mean God gave me this money, so he obviously means for it to be mine, that's not blessed, that's greedy. Those aren't the same term. So I get a little nervous about Christian's ter- uh, use of the term blessed. Now, I, I tested the Christian vocabulary recently on, on Facebook. I, I posted on Facebook, does Jesus really want us to be happy? And many people replied, many of you replied, thank you for being my friends. My social media self is not lonely. Thank you for being my uh, friends and commenting on that. And a lot of people said exactly what I thought they'd say, because I I had the sense that happy was a word like lucky, where Christians would have a substitute word for it. And a lot of people got on there and said, not happy, joyful. And I'm okay with that. If by joyful what you mean is God wants us to be at peace with the world, though the world is in chaos, though sometimes times are good, sometimes times are bad, God wants us to be at peace with him, joyful. Good, I get it. I totally get that. I agree with you if that's what you mean by joyful. If you don't like happy, because when I say happy, you picture the five-year-old at Disneyland at four o'clock in the afternoon who is starting to melt down, and you have taken out a second mortgage on your house to be able to afford to go to Disneyland, and you are not letting that kid drag you home six hours before the fireworks. So you start to pump that kid full of cotton candy and soda to keep him revved up to make it to the fireworks. I get it, not that. If that's happy, not that. That's not what Jesus wants. I agree with you if that's what you're picturing. Totally. But honestly, I'm not sure if I like the word joyful better than happy. I, I, I'm, I think sometimes when we use that, we miss what Jesus really wants for us. Because I think Jesus actually wants us to be happy. And not in kind of super spiritual way. Like I have kids, and I love my kids, and I love it when my kids laugh. And when they were little, I used to roll them up in sofa cushions and pretend like I was an Italian chef making a pizza. And I would use an outrageous Italian accent that would probably get me fired from most universities today, but I didn't care. I'd curl up my mustache, I'd make the pizza, I'd put the cheese on it, and it ended, of course, in me eating the pizza, which meant making them laugh so hard they could not breathe anymore. And Jesus loves me more than I love my kids. I love my kids a lot. And Jesus loves me more than I love my kids. I honestly think Jesus wants us to be giggly, giddy, rolling out, laughing, having a blast, making a pizza out of you happy. So I hesitate to just use the word joyful if we're trying to take that away. I want all that. I want all that for everybody who knows Jesus. I think he wants us to be giggling, giddy, roll on the floor, laugh out loud, having a blast happy. If you tell people you only want them to be joyful, it feels a little bit like the the teenage girl who gets invited out on a date by the boy at church that she doesn't actually like. He asks her out to a school dance, let's say, and she doesn't actually like him. So instead of just saying no, she does something worse, and she says... I like you, but only in a Christian way, which is another way of saying, I don't like you at all. And now that kid's taking a step closer to atheism because she likes him in a Christian way. You know what that sounds like? I like you like I like drywall. It keeps the rain out and I don't have to pay attention to it. That is how I like you. I don't think Jesus likes us in a Christian way. I think Jesus wants us to be giggly, giddy, laughing out loud, rolling on the floor, happy. And so I hesitate to just use joyful if we're trying to take away all that good stuff. So be careful, Christians, how you use your words. By the way, when I posted it on Facebook, I said, uh, does Jesus really want us to be happy asking for a friend? That is also code. Between you and I, that is code for my wife and I disagree with this, and I'm being passive aggressive and posting on Facebook so you can all agree with me and she'll have to see that. And once again, you guys failed me and everybody agreed with her. You know what that's like for me? For can you look with the outside of Facebook? I know. <clears throat> I'm glad you're giggling at that. My therapist says I'm not funny. Um, but I want to talk today about the word blessed because I think blessed at its heart is a beautiful idea. I think blessed means spiritually healthy, and it's entirely possible to be 
spiritually healthy or spiritually unhealthy, just like it's possible to be physically healthy and physically unhealthy. And I think Jesus wants us to be spiritually healthy, spiritually healthy and happy. And so I want to have a conversation with you today that a pastor is not supposed to have with his congregation. I want to have you, with you a, the kind of conversation that a pastor is not supposed to have with his congregation. Because I want to talk to you about what you should look for when you are looking for a church. Now, don't leave. I like you, and I like our church. And hopefully, after we talk about spiritually healthy, you'll say, real life is those things. I want to be in real life because it is spiritually healthy. But I want to talk to you about what you should look for when you're looking for a church. Because, in part, our graduates are graduating. And some of them are moving. And they'll be going elsewhere in the country, and they need to look for a church. If you are a graduate and you're moving away, you should have started this search already. You should have looked for churches before you chose the college. You should be looking for churches now in whatever city you're going to. Because over the next four years, your spiritual development is more important than your intellectual development. You should plan on your spiritual growth ahead of time. So look into the future and begin thinking, what kind of church am I going to? What does it look like to be a spiritually healthy church? This actually matters. Some of us I know are moving to other parts of the world. We, we ought to be looking for churches where we know we're moving and asking what does it mean to be spiritually healthy? So uh, open with me, if you would, in your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 8. And we're going to look at uh, a situation uh, in which somebody came along who at first appeared to be spiritually healthy, but who was not. And you actually might want to just bookmark this study because you might not be looking for a church today. I hope not. But, uh, but the day may come. Life brings change with it. And the day may come where you have to look around and say, now where is a spiritually healthy church? So bookmark this. If you know somebody who's in the process of moving right now, send them a link to this. I want, I want us thinking about this ahead of time. Let's look at Acts chapter 8. Acts is the story of the early church. It's the, the story of the disciples of Jesus. After he died and rose from the dead and went to heaven, the disciples went around starting churches and Acts tells their story. It's written by a guy named Luke. And uh, in Acts, they encounter all kinds of different people, including a guy named Simon. Now, this is not Simon Peter, the disciple of Jesus. This is a different Simon. And this Simon was known as a magician. He was known as having all kinds of uh, spiritual powers. And then when he met Jesus, uh, he had this, this profound interaction with the disciples. Let's look at Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 9. Listen to the word of God. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. That's the area around God's people. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with this magic. Now, don't give in to the modern liberal interpretation, and by that I mean the theological term, the theologically liberal interpretation, that this guy was good at working parlor tricks, and they, so they assumed he was magic. Don't assume that. That's not what the text says. Don't assume that he was a, an early naturalistic scientist who understood science, and people who didn't understand it were just so amazed by it that they thought it was magic. That's not what the text says. The text says that this guy found a source of power in the world which was supernatural. And there are different sources of power in the world that are supernatural. And Simon, Simon the magician, had found one and was able to do things that amazed the people who saw it. There's a tradition in, this, in the Bible that goes all the way back, back to the very beginning. Remember when Moses went to lead the people out of Egypt. And he went to the Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no way, Jose, which is a strange name for Egypt, but that's what they said. And Moses turned the Nile to blood. And then Pharaoh's advisors could do the same kinds of supernatural things. That wasn't just a, a superstitious, legendary telling of what happened. There are different sources of power in the world. And that's why Simon is drawing a crowd. Verse 12, 
But when they, the followers of Simon, when they believed Philip, who is an early disciple of Jesus, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, two of the bigwigs, two of the followers of Jesus. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. They had, uh, they had been baptized with water into the name of Jesus. They believed in Jesus, but they had not yet received the source of power that God had for them. Now listen, this is important. If the church is not supernatural, the church is superficial. The first Christian church was supernatural. They witnessed miracles of healing at the laying on of their hands in their prayers they witnessed miracles that were supernatural and if the church is not supernatural the church is superficial next week here at real life we're going to begin a series called supernatural and it's literally super period natural period because when god does amazing things in the church it should be super we should be amazed by it but it should also be natural you should expect that it happens he's god after all this is what was going on in the early church there was radical transformation going on. And it was not just people changing their minds about ideas. People were changing the source of power that they drew from in this world. And the Holy Spirit was a supernatural source of power. Verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of the wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. This was Simon. This was Simon known as Simon the Magician or Simon Magus. And in the second century, church leaders would record his story that after this encounter, he turned back towards dark powers, seeking power in this world and pulling crowds after him. He became a Sith Lord is what I'm saying. For those of us who got this, okay? Uh, the Middle Ages are filled with stories of Simon. He became the source of legends, and they told stor stories about Simon the sorcerer who led astray so many people in the early church. Now, let's use Simon to begin a conversation about spiritual health. Let's talk about being spiritually healthy. Let's talk about being blessed, looking first at Simon. And let's talk about cults. A cult is a religious group or religious organization that uses manipulation or force to draw loyalty from its followers, usually while giving them false theological teachings, false theological doctrines. This is what a cult is. It's a religious organization that uses manipulation or force to win the loyalty of its followers, usually in exchange for false theological teachings. Uh, you heard me uh, a week or two ago make, make fun of Scientology and talk about how I think Scientology is a science fiction uh, nonsense that steals money from people, because that's what it is. And, and I said that, uh, and that, that's a cult. That's what you would call a cult. They use manipulation to take money from people and, and keep their adherence. Uh, now, let me talk about one that's a little bit more sensitive to our community here. Let's talk about Mormonism. Because uh, whether you realize it or not, Glendora is actually very famous among the Mormons. It has been a, a Mormon center for a large, large part of uh, history. Uh, and I want to distinguish one thing first before we get going. I want to distinguish the people that you know in your life who are Mormons, who are good, ethical, loving people with great families who are good neighbors, people you like, 
who are good business partners, who are your friends. I want to distinguish those from the source of Mormonism, the, the story of Joseph Smith 100, 150 years ago, and the, the truth of those doctrines, because those are not actually the same thing. It's entirely possible to have a very good doctor, a good, wise, smart, well-trained doctor who accidentally makes a bad prescription. And the fact that there's a bad prescription doesn't invalidate the fact that he's a good doctor. Or vice versa. You can have a very bad doctor who doesn't know what he's doing who accidentally makes a good prescription. And that good prescription doesn't suddenly make him a good doctor. They're not the same thing. The validity of the source of things and the, the, the truth or the goodness of the results are not the same. So let's distinguish the Mormons who are our friends, who we know, who we like, or good folks from the origin of the story itself. And let me talk about the origin of the story. Joseph Smith, some 150 years ago, claimed that an angel had appeared to him and was talking to him and gave him some golden tablets, which no one have, has been able to find. And he began translating these tablets from some foreign alien language into English. He was unable to retranslate them again when tested. But he uh, claimed that this, this angel told him that after rising from the dead over in the Middle East, Jesus materialized in North America which is not true, and that there arose armies of soldiers with armor and swords here in North America who fought great battles long before the Europeans came here, which is absolutely not true. In fact, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. has said there is absolutely no historical or archaeological evidence that backs up the story of Mormonism. There's just no validity to it. The New York Times has widely covered the fact that Joseph Smith in his day was sleeping with the wives of a number of the other Mormon leaders, of the other, a number of his friends. And at the end of his life, when he died in a prison riot, he was running for president of the United States to gain more money and power and attention for himself. Now, when we talk about spiritually healthy, there are two characteristics that are true of all spiritually healthy organizations and all spiritually healthy people. And the first one is this. Spiritually healthy people love the truth. Spiritually healthy organizations love the truth. So much so that when something is not true, it grates on you. It hangs on you. You can't get it off your conscience. So we may know good and loving and thoughtful and ethical Mormons, but that does not change the fact that the source of that that faith, the source of that religion, is not true. And that matters. If the day comes in your life where you're out there looking for a church, I want you looking for a church that loves the truth because truth matters. Truth counts. There are uh, all kinds of uh, organizations and even churches in this world which can build up uh, huge, successful followings, big crowds, without loving the truth. There was a preacher about 100 years ago in London named Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he was popular. He had huge crowds. He was a big, well-known preacher. If, if we had said the name Martin Lloyd-Jones 100 years ago, everybody would know who we were talking about. And he built this big, just packed the house in London. But at the end of his life, he said, I think a little bit mournfully, it's possible to build a crowd without building a church. And I think he knew that that is, that is part of what he had done. He had gathered crowds around him without making disciples of Jesus. It is possible to build a crowd without building a church. And you know people in our world, in our society, pastors who have big, huge organizations that are fun, filled with money, that are popular, and they look around and there are no disciples. And they may not be doing it intentionally. But at the, the heart of every spiritually healthy organization is that the organization loves the truth. We are a truth-telling organization, especially if we are a healthy organization. Now, that is not a popular thing to say today. And I once had somebody uh, take me to task on this. I was teaching a philosophy class at a university. And I was doing my little comedic rendition about sci Scientology. I was kind of ranting about Scientology. And a woman in the front row said, you can't say that. It is not right to say that the beliefs of a huge group of people are wrong. And in... In fact, today, it has become very unpopular to say that certain ideologies or beliefs or viewpoints are wrong. You're supposed to respect them as someone else's view, and it's just not your view, but you can't say objectively that it's wrong. This is what she tells me, is I tell her that Scientology is a fraud. And I looked at her and I said, okay, if you give me $20 right now, I promise you, 
you will go to heaven. And she kind of looked at me suspiciously. And I said, no, 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 this is your deal. So you have two choices right now. You can either tell me I'm wrong, which you just said I can't do. Or honestly, probably the best deal you're ever going to get, 20 bucks. Heaven tickets are not cheap. Have you looked at those? It's like worse than Hamilton. Right? I'm giving you like the Groupon of heaven travel. Buy my $20 heaven ticket right now. Now, I didn't want her $20. What I want to do is show comedically on a small scale what evil men have done on a large scale. It's entirely possible to lie in the name of religion to take people's money, and many people have done it historically. And if you are spiritually healthy, if you love the truth, it's not wrong to say that is deception, that is lie, and that is not okay. Spiritually healthy people love the truth. Now, we do that in all gentleness and respect. We do that in love. If you are a follower of Jesus, you love the truth and you love people. You do this graciously. You don't do this to tear people down. You do this to invite them in. Uh, I remember uh, visiting a church several years ago, and I was, met somebody at the church, and I said, tell me about the church. And they said, well, we're sort of a, a God church, but not really a Jesus church. And what they mean is we kind of like our religion vague. We're a God church and not a Jesus church. That's like saying we're a six church and not a half dozen church. It's the same thing. What they were saying is we don't really want the truth crowding us too much. But spiritually healthy organizations love the truth. Now, secondly, spiritually healthy organizations, spiritually healthy people are filled with love. They are just absolutely loving context. They, the spiritually healthy church makes you feel loved. And, and I'll show you what it's like. I, I'll, show you, I'll show you what I mean here. Uh, but I'm going to need a volunteer uh, from the crowd here to give me $20. I need somebody here to give me uh, $20. I will not promise that you will get into heaven, but I will put in the good word for you. So give me $20 right now. Does anybody up here in the front row, does anybody have like a $20 bill I can just borrow for a little bit? Just for the first, oh, wow. Okay, fine. Spiritually, oh, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Steal that from you. Let's say thank you to Karen. Say thank you to Karen. Thank you, Karen. Okay. All right, let's get back to the Bible study. If we're, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, this is a $20 bill. Everybody see this? How much is this worth? $20. I'm not, this is not Einstein up here. I'm just, matter of fact, this is $20, right? Okay. I'll give this back to you after. How much is it worth now? It's worth $20, isn't it? This is sriracha sauce. Very spicy. They make it over here in Irwindale, actually. How much is it worth now? It's worth $20. That's amazing. What's it worth to you? <laughs> okay. This is dirt from my yard, from the backyard. Where the dogs go. <laughs> What's it worth now? $20. It's worth $20. It's still worth $20. It's worth $20 because its value does not come from the condition that it is in. Its value does not come from the way it has been treated. Its value comes from the fact that it is backed by the government of the United States who says that piece of paper is worth $20. Now listen, you are backed by God. And God loves you infinitely. And it does not matter how you have been treated in this life. And it does not matter what condition you are in now. It does not matter what kind of brokenness you have been through. It does not matter what kind of things you have done to yourself. God loves you infinitely, and nothing can take that value away from you. Any church that makes you feel like you are not loved is the wrong church. No church has the right to do that to somebody. Look at the last 2,000 years, the history of Christianity and the abuse that churches have dealt out on people. No church has the right to make you feel like anything less than you are. And you are an infinitely loved child of God. Any church that makes you feel different than that is the wrong church. That's a, that's a good illustration, isn't it? 
that's a, uh, a good illustration, um, except I forgot, uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure, I, I'm just going to give this back to you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for loaning it to me, I appreciate it. Good job, good job. Okay. Still worth 20 bucks. <clears throat> okay. Now listen, every spiritually healthy person, don't touch your eyes, that's Sri Raja, okay. Every spiritually uh, healthy person loves the truth and loves God and other people. We as a spiritually healthy organization should be filled with truth and filled with love, walking with Jesus. You can't have just one or the other. Some churches will lean in one direction or the other. You've got to have both. A church that is filled with truth without love is too hard. And a church that is filled with love without truth is too soft. A church that is filled with truth without love is New York. And a church that's filled with love without truth is San Francisco. You've got to land in Kansas on this one. You've got to land in Kansas on this one. You've got to be somewhere in the middle. It's a geographical theology. Listen, Jesus said there will be people who come after me who lead you astray, who teach you false things and deceive you. Look at their fruit. Look at what comes out of them. Look at what they bear. If they are not filled with truth and not filled with love, they're not me. This is actually what he says in Matthew chapter 7. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did not prophesy, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform mi many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Because spiritually powerful and spiritually healthy aren't the same thing. It is possible to be spiritually powerful without being spiritually healthy. And any church that is big and powerful and rich and popular but doesn't have love is bound for the fire. We, as a people of God, walk with Jesus filled with truth and love. That's what he wants for us. And that's what I want us to be as Real Life Church. Uh, I'm going to pray for us in just a second. And as I do, I'm going to ask you if you're ready to make a commitment. I'm going to ask you a couple different things. Just everybody prays, their eyes closed. I'm going to ask, if, if you've never said, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want you to teach me how to be healthy. I'm going to invite you in prayer in just a minute to raise your hand. Make that commitment. Step over that line. Or if there's some, some area in your life that through this series you've seen and said, Hey, I want to be healthier in that way. I'm going to invite you to make a commitment, whether it's physical health or emotional health or financial health or spiritual health. If you've said, hey, I need to make that decision, I need to make that commitment, I'm going to invite you in prayer to raise your hand and say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to ask that Jesus make me healthy in that way. I'm going to focus on being healthy in that area. So stand with me together and we'll pray. Please stand. So I'll close our eyes and lift our hearts. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you want us to be giddy, laughing out loud, rolling on the floor, happy. And I thank you that you want us to be healthy. I pray that we would begin with a relationship with you, knowing that our value comes from not what we do, not what we've done, not what's been done to us, but from your grace and your love, you declare that we are of infinite value. So if there's anybody here who's never decided before to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I trust in your love. If you've never done that before and you want to do that now in prayer with your eyes closed, just, just raise your hand where you are. Raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Thank you. And if, if you are at a place in your life where you realize something in your life has been broken, something in your life has not been healthy and you want it to be healthy and you want to commit yourself to working on health in that area, if you want to pray that Jesus will bring health to you in that area, raise your hand right now. I pray for you. Father, you see our hearts, you see our needs. 
We want to be a healthy people, a people who live the kind of life that you want us to have, the kind of life that you gave us. We want to be healthy and happy in the name of Jesus. Teach us to walk in truth. Teach us to walk in love. And as you shape us and heal us and make us healthy, may people look in our direction and see Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.